Let's take a look at what an upper class lady would have worn in a day in 1872. She would start her day by either breakfasting with her family downstairs or by having breakfast in bed. Either way, by the time she was getting ready to leave the bedroom, she would start in her underwear. I'm wearing combination underwear. That is a combination of a chemise and drawers. Or she could wear a separate chemise and drawers. And then I add my stockings and garters to that. Stockings and underwear were typically store-bought and standard sizes. Though according to some magazines, some women preferred to make their own underwear so that it would fit better. Both underwear and stockings could be cotton, linen, silk, or wool, depending on the season and the lady's preference. Since I'm starting my day in a casual wrapper for morning wear, I opted to not wear a corset yet, and I'm wearing a travel or leisure wear bustle. This type of bustle is made out of layers of different sized crescents of stiff fabric like horsehair and attached to a drawstring waist. This way it can lay flat for convenient storage and then be ruffled up again for extra oomph when wearing. These are extremely convenient in tight quarters in a carriage because they crush in on you very easily so that you don't take extra room when sitting but then they floof back out once you get up and walk around and because they're extremely lightweight you don't necessarily need to wear a corset with them so that's why they're very convenient for leisure wear women of the time viewed a corset much like we view a bra so when you're out in public you would normally wear one but you didn't necessarily have to wear one at home when just lounging around that is more a personal preference friends thing just like today some women want to keep their bra on and some people when they change into their home sweats they'll take the bra off and even though I'm getting ready to wear a wrapper and just lounge around or do maybe my accounting or write letters or just have breakfast with my family I'm still gonna wear a petticoat because the petticoat will keep the wrapper from tangling onto my legs and getting caught on them and making especially climbing upstairs and going downstairs a much easier task. And also because it will keep the wrapper further away from my body, it will also keep the wrapper cleaner and also help with air circulation. If it's cold, it will help keep me warmer inside because there's air trapped between me and the wrapper and if it's warm outside or hot then it will help by keeping the air cooler because there isn't anything directly against my skin heating up my skin. Petticoats of this era are typically cotton or linen and are heavily starched like mine. Though for extra warmth in the winter, a wool or silk or even quilted petticoat might be used along with the heavier starched petticoat. These petticoats could have a regular waistband or a drawstring waistband in the back, and they would typically also have a drawstring in the back holding the volume there. Then I put my wrapper on. This one is silk, but printed cotton ones were also very popular, as were wool ones and quilted ones for the winter. Mine is based on an extant garment in the Indianapolis Museum of Art. And in the early 1870s, most women would wear a cap for deshabille wear still. This one is a lace edged, a flowy piece of fabric draped around a wired base. As the 70s progress, these start to fall out of favor for the younger women. And because wrappers were at home garments not intended for outdoor use, they often could have outrageously long trains on them because you didn't have to worry about soiling them. And next, it's time to get dressed in daywear. This is a step up in formality from a wrapper, so this is something you could go outside for a walk or visiting friends in. So with this, you would wear a corset unless you're an adamant dress reformer. The silhouette of the day is very short-waisted and curvy. So the bust line of these corsets is very low and starts almost immediately after the most narrow part of your waist. 
without giving the effect of a droopy bust. The hips are cut fairly high because the skirts create so much volume at the hip that it doesn't really matter what it does there. And to balance out that huge back curve of that huge bustle, the stomach flares out quite a bit, creating a belly pooch or belly curve. And because this is intended for a slightly more formal wear, I am wearing a proper wired bustle with this. This type of large bustles are the height of fashion from about 69 to the early years of the 70s. And about 73, 74, the bustles start getting slightly smaller. But there are simultaneously in fashion several different styles of bustles, so there isn't just one right bustle. And as you can see, it gets tied quite high on my waist to create that short-waisted silhouette. And next comes my starched petticoat again. The same pattern petticoat works with both bustles. That ruffle at the bottom of the petticoat helps create that wide skirt silhouette of the era that was sometimes even helped with hoops. And as you can see, even though my waist isn't really cinched in at all, my waist looks tiny compared to that huge bustle. And next comes my silk skirt. This one has a slight train to it, making it appropriate for both daytime and evening time wear, depending on what bodice I wear with it. Veil silk or ribbed silk was the most popular and most expensive and on trend type of silk in 1872. But because prices were skyrocketing due to the war in Europe, as a cheaper alternative, especially for evening wear, was suggested a silk made out of thicker thread that itself created that rough kind of ribbed look to it, but that would be see-through if you looked at it held up towards light. And I don't know about you, but to me that Harper's Bazaar's description sounds awfully a lot like modern day do peony. At this time in history, it was fashionable to either have a skirt with an overskirt and a bodice, or a garment that has both in one called a polonaise, and that's what I'm putting on here now. And the polonaise is a remake of the 1780s fashion. So a circular fashion cycle is in no way new. This type of polonaises were often very roughly with a bunch of trimming on them and often made out of striped silk like mine or out of cotton or silk in a floral Dolly Varden pattern. Both fabric choices being a nod again to the 18th century. And next comes my black velvet belt that has loops for bustling up the polonaise. This type of skirt lifter is shown in the May 11th edition of Harper's Bazaar. It can be also used for lifting up your train and making it into a round skirt when walking outside. It is closed by an original belt buckle that has little spikes that go through the fabric to hold it in place. These type of buckles were typically sold separately and you'd add whatever kind of fabric or ribbon you wanted. Belts were typically worn for decoration, but they could also hold a chatelaine or a chatelaine bag like mine, though the skirt itself has spacious pockets. And here I'm all ready to go for a promenade. I've already added my bonnet, and I'm waiting for my companions to be ready as well. And you're, here you can see the velvet loops from the belt going underneath the polonaise to bustle it up. Hats and bonnets of this era tend to be small things that are just perched on top of the hair rather than providing a lot of sun or other protection. On a sunny day, a lady would typically carry a parasol for sun protection instead. And lastly, heading out the door, I don on my kid leather gloves. I'm not carrying a parasol with me because even though it is a bright day, it is cloudy, so I don't really need one. And lastly, for the evening, I change into evening wear. And for that, I change into a chemise that has a neckline that is more appropriate for evening wear and into a much daintier, much curvier corset. And though tight lacing was by no means common in any era, and it was highly discouraged against, it was most common to see tight lacing happening in evening wear. Just like today, it might be common to see extremely high heels in evening wear. But again, mostly this extreme curviness of the silhouette is created by the illusion of the corset and the bustle, not actually tight lacing necessarily. I am here not very tightly laced. I am about two inches laced down and the rest is illusion. I'm wearing the same bustle and the same shape petticoat again. Hairstyles of this era could be quite elaborate updos even during daytime, but they got even more elaborate for evening wear. Artificial flowers, gems, and even pearls were common hair accessories, as were tiaras and fancy hair combs. 
partial updos were also very common for evening wear with the ringlets or braids flowing down from the hairstyle. My corset is still quite new and needs breaking in and that's why the lacing is uneven. Corsets mold into your body with wear and become more comfortable once they have been worn in, just like shoes do. Though but this is by no means uncomfortable like this either. In fact, with a few minutes of wear, I completely forget that it's there other than the fact that my back feels more supported. Evening jewelry of this era could be quite elaborate and especially earrings could be very large. It was a common way to show off your wealth, be it in a more subtle way or with very, very large statement pieces. For my ball gown, I'm using the same ribbed silk skirt that I used for my daytime polonaise gown. This has deep pockets in the front and a slight train in the back, perfect for dancing, as it isn't long enough to actually trip on. The hem is faced with a cotton dust ruffle, and the waistband is created of a glazed cotton lining fabric, since it won't be visible anyways once the garment is fully on. This type of little tricks to save the expensive fabric were common even amongst the ultra-rich. When choosing colors for evening wear, one very important fact should never be overlooked, and that is that gas lamp light makes colors appear very different because of the yellow tint in the light. That's why light shades, especially yellow tinted, tend to be recommended for evening wear. According to Harper's Bazaar, those green greens which incline to yellow look the prettiest of an evening. Thus, apple green acquires a brilliant tint of emerald. Peacock green loses its blue reflex and becomes yellowish. Yellow materials are certain those which appear, appear the best at lamplight, especially silks and satins. Buttercup yellow, so bright at any time is even brighter at evening. Straw color becomes rosier, sulfur color does not change, and maize becomes exquisitely soft and clear. All brunettes know extremely be how extremely becoming it is on them in the ballroom. My overskirt is a small apron style edged with lace. The waistband closes with hooks and eyes at the center back, and then the hangy bits at the sides tie in a knot in the back creating beautiful drapery over the bustle. Ball gowns of this era typically had a separate overskirt instead of a polonaise style gown, though polonaise style dresses could be seen for other types of evening wear, like dinner gowns for instance. The difference between dinner wear and other evening wear and a ball gown is that other evening wear tended to have longer sleeves, while ball gowns could have extremely short or absolutely no sleeve at all. As for the materials, the overskirt could match the bottom skirt, or if the bodice was a separate ma material, it could also match the bodice and not the skirt, or it could be made out of a separate gauzy material or lace if that was also present in the skirt as well. Mix and match styles were extremely common. So not only could a skirt have multiple bodices to wear for different occasions, they could also have different colored bodices and overskirts that could be mixed and matched together with different skirts as long as the colors went together. And next, because we're getting ready for a ball, I'm wearing my ball gown bodice. This is made out of the same ribbed silk as the rest of the outfit and is trimmed with the same lace as the overskirt and it is lined with cotton. As the century progresses, silk linings would become more popular, especially in the more high-end bodices, but for now, they are typically lined with cotton or linen. That was often, but not always, glazed. And to ensure a snug fit, there's a waistband on the interior of the ball gown bodice, which you would close first before attaching the hooks and eyes. Ball gown bodices of this era typically either closed with hooks and eyes in the front, or it could have laces up the back. And this lacing was typically left visible. Necklines for evening wear bodices were typically quite low, but in the early part of the 70s, they typically would not show cleavage yet. The biggest trend in evening bodices of 1872 was this double pointed front that is left open at the bottom, almost as if there wouldn't be patterned enough hip room into it. And one last quick outfit check before I don on my shoes. I add a small flower corsage to the middle of my neckline. These could be worn at the neckline like I'm wearing it, or at the shoulder, or even at parts of the overskirt. 
for evening footwear options, I'm opting for embroidered silk boots. Or rather, they would have been embroidered silk in the era. These are modern reproductions by American Duchess and are made out of polyester satin with a period accurate leather lining for a more modern easy care alternative. And lastly, I add a pair of short kid leather gloves. And now I'm ready to waltz my evening away on the dance floor. I hope you enjoyed this video and found it educational and interesting and maybe learned something new today. If you did, please consider hitting that like button and giving me a follow if you don't already so that I can see you again next time. Bye.